Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started, and if people are coming in, then uh, uh, I'll just have to catch up. Uh, so this talk that I'm going to do, um, these aren't the only five things you need to do, but they are five things that are, I chose these because it gets you to think about a different perspective on scaling. So um, we'll, we'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, there are references and hyperlinks and all that in the slide materials themselves. So if you have a chance to look at those later, um, there's some additional things to learn. Um, so the five things that you need to think about to when you think about scaling your organization, uh, it's not really related to things like uh, scaling frameworks or processes, but what most organizations find is that when they go to scale Agile, the biggest challenge is culture. And so these five different dimensions here are all sort of directed at the cultural dimension. And so in order to uh, support and protect Agile values with strong leadership, help teams and, and stakeholders to self-organize, manage towards outcomes, not output, systematically re remove waste, and improve through feedback. So I'm going to talk about each one of these briefly. Um, again, you know, this is uh, a lot to cover in 45 minutes. So if I am if I move too fast, um, we've got probably time for questions at the end. So in the, as most organizations look at scaling, the first thing I like to ask when I'm talking to them is, essentially, why do you want to scale? And so when you consider some of the, the reasons why organizations are wanting to choose Agile, a lot of times organizations will say things like, well, we want, we want to improve cycle time, we want to improve our responsiveness to the market. And the reason behind that is illustrated by some of the points in this slide, is that you know if you look at Uber, you know it's the largest taxi company, owns no cars. Or Apple and Google are the largest, basically, software vendors. The app stores are, you know, have the most revenue going through them. They don't develop most of those apps. Um, Netflix is the world's largest movie distributor. They don't have any theaters. So all of these things have more or less happened in the last 10 years. Uh, the iPhone just basically celebrated its 10-year anniversary last year. And so all of, and, and actually it didn't have apps for the first year. So all of these things have happened relatively quickly. It's the, the world is changing, and, and most of us are here because of that. Um, the thing to also think about is these companies were once regarded as the leaders in their industries, and they regarded themselves as basically invulnerable to attack. They had huge market shares, and yet in a relatively small period of time, in some cases just years, they went from dominant in their positions like BlackBerry, you know, when the, when the iPhone first came out, everybody said, well, you know, uh, it doesn't have a, a keyboard, it's never going to sell for the business community. BlackBerry nearly went out of business just a few years later. So the, fa the fa fortunes of the organizations can change pretty rapidly, and one person's threat is another person's opportunity. So. That's the motivation behind this, and, and why it's important to know the motivation is that the cultural change that has to happen in order to scale Agile in an organization really has to start with, why are we doing this? What's, imp what's important? How are we aligning to some larger goal? And then teams, at basically self-organizing, cross-functional teams, can align to those goals and make better decisions by understanding the goals better. So you can think about, these organizations, your organizations, our, even Scrum.org, you know, we're all sort of squeezed in between competitors or alternatives to our solution and the customers or the users of that solution. So they, they, there's two different dynamics, and organizations are trying to be more responsive. Now, change is hard, and I've, I've paraphrased something by Peter Drucker here. Peter Drucker originally said, um, culture eats process for breakfast, or there's a variety of different ways of looking at this. Um, culture also eats Agile for breakfast, and it establishes, and essentially there's a cultural inertia in most organizations to continue doing the things that you've done in the past. And the culture, in a sense, inoculates the organization against certain kinds of change. And what we have to do is figure out a way to change that dynamic so that the 
people in the organization are now focused on a new goal. So the, um, I think this is a, something from um, Buckminster Fuller, but there are variations on it, is that you can never create, you can never basically destroy an old order. What you have to do is create a new order and then get people to move over to this. So from the perspective of, of this, to think about it, Peter Senge, um, I was talking to uh, my colleague Nugesh just before this about Peter Senge and the fifth discipline, but um, Peter observed that people don't resist change, they resist being changed. So if they feel like they're part of the change, they're much more likely to participate in, in that. So having that focus on goals, that you know this is a new goal, we can only achieve this by adopting agile practices, and having everybody really strongly believe that is really essential to having agile being adopted. If they feel like it's just something they're complying with, or just something that they, they, they're being told to do, uh, because it's the latest thing, or because you know people, the organization wants to reduce cost, then they d they don't get as motivated. So the key thing to think about is that a lot of people, I think, make the mistake of talking about well, we need to change people's mindset, and they act like well, you know, we've got to we have to convince them that they want to work in a new way, and we've got to win their their hearts and minds. But when you look at a number of different studies. The, the data says that what you actually need to do is get people to work in a different way and gradually their minds and the culture and the belief system reorients itself to the new way of working. Um, another way of putting this is that you can, in a sense, lecture people all you want about the value of empiricism and the value of doing short delivery cycles and getting information back. But if all you've ever experienced is a traditional waterfall delivery process or relatively long cycles, you don't really understand what that means. You keep translating it back into terms that you understand and you say, oh, well, we get feedback all the time. We get feedback on requirements, we get feedback on design, we get feedback on architecture, and we get feedback all the time. It's not the same kind of feedback, but until you experience what feedback in Scrum means, you, you really don't have an understanding of that. So the most important thing is to get people to work in a different way and then gradually the culture follows along with that. Now, back up. Um, so so what the role that leaders play in this transformation is that leaders help establish those shared goals. They help the organization align around those goals and, and basically create a compelling reason to change. The second piece of it is that leaders play a role in making it safe to change. Uh, making, taking the risk out of it, saying it's okay to fail. It's okay to not achieve what you set out to achieve if you learn something from it. And that's really the key. You know, we, none of us like the word failure, but the reality is that, you know, the old saying goes, you know, good judgment comes from experience, most of which comes from bad judgment. So, you know, you're going to have to make some mistakes and things don't work out the way that you expected. And the real problem with the traditional delivery process is that you don't get feedback early enough to figure out you're doing the wrong thing. So the third thing is that leaders actually model the change by, by showing people a different way of work working and demonstrating that, then they, they essentially serve as role models for the rest of the organization. So that's sort of the first thing. So leaders really are the key to getting this cultural change to happen. Now, you know, this is sort of point number one. There's still four other points, so it's, that's necessary, but it's not completely sufficient. So the second thing leaders have to do, in addition to those things, is that they have to help teams and the stakeholders to self-organize. And you know, anyone who's been through a Scrum class or has been through you know, other Agile, Agile practices, you, you know that self-organization is really important. But a lot of times, people think, well, that, that's the Scrum team doing that. The Scrum team sort of self-organizing. And the reality is that the entire business has to self-organize, or at least the area of, of the product that you're delivering. So you can't, you can't really do Scrum well if you have the business off doing detailed requirements documents and working in six-month cycles and long-term product planning and ignoring all the feedback that they can get from every single sprint. So, one of the things to think about is that uh, John Cotter is one of is is a uh, professor at Harvard, written lots of books on organizational change, and he makes the observation that 
the organizational structure that we use today was designed to solve a different problem than what we're trying to do with Agile. And that different problem basically had to do with relatively poorly trained workers who didn't have a lot of autonomy. They, they weren't cross-functional. They were essentially working on, uh, on repetitive tasks, which were relatively easy to define. Um, but when you look at a dynamic situation, that model doesn't work. Uh, a lot of people think that the military is organized in a hierarchical manner. But actually, going all the way back to Napoleon, the, there, there's essentially a high degree of cross-functionality and autonomy, because when you're in a battlefield situation, you have to make decisions on the spot. You can't go clear it with somebody who may or may not be, you know, might be a miles away. So that's one thing to think about. The organizational structure is it, uh, of most organizations isn't really optimized to work in an agile way. Now, what's different and, and what enables us to think about a new kind of organizational structure that's much more, in a sense, cross-functional and self-organizing and cohesive is that there's another piece, essentially, from behavioral psychology that's illustrated in this book by Dan Pink. And there's a, a URL, really nice short video to watch there. Um, but, but his key message in this, in Drive, is essentially that we aren't motivated by money. We're not, voted, we're not motivated by promotions. We're not motivated by all these other things. We're actually motivated by having a strong sense of autonomy in what we do, feeling that you know, I'm very competent, I know what to do, you know, I, I have a strong mastery over what I'm working on, uh, I have a strong mastery over, over my, my, uh, the ex expertise that I exhibit, and I'm, I'm working towards something that's worth working on. And that it's only when you have relatively simple mechanical tasks that paying people more for producing more is, is motivating. So one of the theories behind that traditional organization is, is essentially wrong. It doesn't reflect what we've now learned about, about psychology. So the challenge that leaders have is to essentially free the people from the structure of that existing organization and leverage the intrinsic uh, motivation that, in a sense, drives everybody. So this traditional organization, you can think of that as being very hierarchical, you know, CEO at the top, VPs, middle managers, line managers, finally you get employees. And all the way at the bottom, if you can read that, are customers. Or you know, if you're developing internal applications, users. And to get the benefits of these self-organizing autonomous teams, you really want to invert that. And and sometimes, you know, so the interesting thing is we refer to this as bottom-up intelligence, that you know, the people at the bottom of the organization who are working closest to customers have the best insight into what to do for those customers. Well, here, you know, just for, for visualization purposes, I put customers at the top, because in a sense, the customers are the top priority. And then the people who serve those customers directly are the next highest priority. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then managers and the CEO. <coughs> so there's a whole bank of literature now that talks about serving leadership and the value of supporting those, those autonomous cross-functional teams. And so this is starting to take hold. But, you know, I've, you know, if you pick up things like you know, MIT Sloan Journal or Harvard Business Review, you see lots of articles today about serving leadership. And so that this model is gradually shifting, and there's much more awareness that, in a sense, to really get the most out of the people in our organization and deliver the most value, we have to let people do their best work and figure out how to free them to do that work even better. So that, and I said earlier that this transformation is not just for the scrum team, and it's not just for the product owner, but it's also for all the stakeholders. So everybody who's working with the team, even in, a, in an extended way, needs to understand and buy into the values of working in this new way to make this work most effectively. Uh, if, they're, if the stakeholders are asking, well, you know, what, what's, what's our uh, project plan, and you know, I want to see detailed milestones, and where are we against the milestones, or even even the question of, you know, and I hear this a lot, um, are we going to get all the features that we want by this particular date for this particular cost? And I'll talk a little bit about why that's not even the right question to ask. But if, if the stakeholders are asking questions like that, then the motivation of a team basically just collapses, sort of like the, the air going out of a balloon. So everybody needs to really buy into this model 
Now, not everybody in the whole organization, but at least everybody working on the product that the team's working on. So the third point, which I started to touch upon, is that the question of, am I going to get all the features that I want by a certain date isn't the right question to ask. And the reason for that is illustrated by this chart. So this is based on a study that uh, a researcher at Stanford did in collaboration with Microsoft. And they used the Bing platform uh, because they're basically doing a you know, continuous delivery model, online, software as a service, very easy to do new releases and measure the results of that. And what they found is that of ideas, not just features, but ideas that they came up with for improving the overall customer experience or improving business results is that they found that a third of the ideas basically improved the outcome. A third of the ideas did nothing. And a third of the ideas actually made things worse. Now, that's pretty sobering if you think about it because it says that this is Microsoft, so arguably they really know what they're doing. They're, they're one of the best managed organizations in the world for delivering software. And if they are spending two-thirds of their effort delivering things that have no business value, what does that say about just an average company? Right? So well, that's sort of one thing to think about. And, and what they found was that there wasn't a correlation between how much experience somebody had, or where they stood in the organization, or you know what their rank was, or anything. Well, everybody on the team had good ideas at various points, and everybody had bad ideas at various points. And so the key thing is to be able to deliver quickly, measure the result, and then quickly adapt. So you know we, we talk in Scrum about inspecting and adapting, and this is really key. And the faster you can do that, the better your business results are. That was one of the, the key learnings that I had when I was working as, a, as an industry analyst at Forrester Research was that there's a strong correlation between the, the speed of feedback or cycle time and overall business performance. So the thing to think about, it's a good little mnemonic, um, you have hippos in India, right? Yeah, maybe. So I don't mean those kind of hippos, though. What I mean are highly paid person's opinions. And so th there was actually a slightly negative correlation between somebody's rank in the organization and the quality of the ideas they came up with, because they're further and further away from the customer. So you know, you get some sales VP comes in and he goes, you know, I just talked to, to you know, my counterpart over at XYZ company, and they, they told me that you know, they absolutely need this particular feature. Well, what usually happens is the team kills itself delivering that particular feature. And then they, they ask the customer, well, you know, how did you like that? And the customer says, what? I've never, I don't use that. It's not valuable to me. Or they, you know, some variation on that particular thing. And, and so the problem is, is that there's lots of theories. And, and again, they're not bad. They're not, you know, they're just theories. And you have to actually deliver something, measure the result, and then improve. So, you know, beware of hippos, highly paid person's opinion. So a better way to work is that you look at what outcomes are we trying to achieve. You step back and say, what's the customer situation? What's their current alternative? And what, where would they like to be with that? What can we do to improve that particular outcome that the, that the customer, or uh, again, you can look at internal users the same way. You know, where are they today? What would they like to do? Or what, not what would they like to do, but what outcome would they like to achieve that they can't achieve today? And then you come up with ideas. And this is, you know, product owners do this, team members could do this, stakeholders could do this. Come up with ideas, frame them, frame them as experiments or hypotheses, develop some, you know, a, a minimum, essentially the minimum amount you need to test that hypothesis. And then, you know, you get feedback that says, that was good, let's do more of that. So that focusing on outcomes is incredibly important to achieving better results. So the way to think about this is that you can look at personas, and, and out of that persona, you can look at, well, what outcomes do they want to achieve? What's their current experience? The satisfaction gap is essentially you know, the, the difference between current desired state 
And the opportunity from an economic standpoint is essentially the value of closing that gap. And so you can use this concept to manage your portfolios to decide how you want to spend money. You, you, you look at where are the biggest gaps? Well, we should spend money on closing those gaps. How do we, do, how do we close those gaps? Well, we form experiments and, and figure out what the best approach is. So, so that's, that's the idea on that. Now, as you, as you deliver those things, as you try to improve your cycle time and improve the time it takes to get feedback, there's lots of waste in, in our processes. And we have to figure out ways to remove those. And leaders, you know, at, scrum masters help with that. The team helps with that. Leaders in the organization can help, help remove these various kinds of impediments. And so we think about what gets hard about scaling is we, we start to you know, add teams. The teams are working pretty well. You know, we maybe get a third team. That works OK. But as we add other teams, we start to get a decline in, in the overall productivity. <coughs> and the reason for that is that we end up having various kinds of impediments and barriers that prevent the team from working as well as it can. So in a lot of cases, the, these are various kinds of cross-team dependencies. And Steve Porter and I are going to be delivering a workshop over the weekend where we're going to talk about how you can use the use something we've developed called Nexus that to help remove cross-team dependencies. But what, however you do it, you have to figure out what are dependencies, what are the bottlenecks, what are the barriers, and, and how do we remove those? So these cross-team dependencies end up basically exploding. And you know if you've got poorly, basically poorly refined product backlog items that involve lots of different teams to get something done, you're going to have lots of different handoffs. You're going to have wait time in there. Um, it, you, you might refine the backlog items so that the backlog items are restricted to one team and they don't have any dependencies. That would be a perfect world. Um, reducing them might be, might be the best you can do. So refinement might be, might, might be an aspect of this. Another aspect might be um, moving to a more modular architecture, like using microservices where you've got a high degree of independence between components. That's another technique. Um, it might simply be you know, having dedicated team members instead of having people spread across multiple teams and having to wait on somebody because they're not available or having more cross-team skills. So, so there's a variety of ways of removing these cross-team dependencies, and that ends up being one of the keys to scaling. Not the only thing. We talked about some of the other things. But, it, but it's a big one, especially down at the team level. The other thing to look at is you can pull basically a technique out of Lean and look at the at a value stream map and look at you know what are all the steps that it takes to go from an idea to when the customer receives benefit from it and you can actually measure that benefit. So or you know uh, essentially uh, one, that, one some people call that measured lead time. So um, some people call it cycle time. There's a finer, a fine distinction. But the point is that there's a lot of different waste in that overall process. It might be waiting for a test environment. It might be waiting for the people doing the test to become available. It might be um, waiting for feedback from the customer. It might be having ops actually deploy it. It might be you know, a whole host of other things. And the interesting thing about doing this kind of analysis is that where you think the waste is isn't always where it is. Now, an example of that is that uh, a number of years ago, I was working with a telecommunications company. And they initially brought me in because they said, well, we want to automate our build and, and test automation process. Um, so you know, can you help us with that? And I said, well, that's great. Sounds, sounds good. Um, maybe we could take a little bit of time and just spend a few hours and, and map out where you're spending the time in the delivery process. And as we did that, a couple of hours later, it became pretty evident that the time wasn't in build and test. The time was actually waiting for a decision. And there were lots of places where you know, people waited for a decision, waiting to get approval for, for to deploy to a test environment, or waiting for uh, approval to do this, or waiting for feedback from users, or waiting for feedback from stakeholders. And all of these different, different wait time basically added up to 70% of their overall lead time was spent waiting. And so we worked with them to try to basically get that number down. And we, we started tackling individual parts of that problem. There wasn't one single solution that solved that. But there were lots of different individual pieces. And so that tech, using that technique, 
doing doing some value stream mapping, trying to figure out where your impediments are, um, you know, this might come out of a sprint red perspective, or it might be something that you know you you uh, spend some time during the sprint to try to figure out. Um, if you if you're running into impediments, you're not going to hit your sprint goal. So, you know, this is a, this is a great technique for trying to figure out where the waste exists. Now, you look at um, and it's hard to read that because of the uh, con color contrast, but if we look at industry statistics and how effective organizations are, these percentage numbers are based on numbers out of a Standish group report. And so uh, the, you know, the average organization is about 50% effective in its collaboration. In other words, about 50%, you know, think of it this way, half of the meetings that you go to are a waste. Probably more than that, actually. But, but let's say that, you know, if, if half of the meetings or half of the interactions that you, you go to you know, you spend hours on a conference call that had, has no value to the things that you're working on or your team's working on. Um, the, you know, in, in the case of the what, you know, you've already seen that, let's say, a third or, in this case, 35% of the features that you build are actually valuable. So if, only, if, if you know, that number improves, you know, that, 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 then you might be able to get perhaps 40% or 50%. But, and then um, the 30% building new features measures how much time do you spend doing maintenance and corrective work versus spending new development. So if we run the example and we say, you know, you've got 8,000, right, just to make it even numbers, I, I put, you know, 8,000 rupees uh, going into that process, how much do you think you really, what's the, in a sense, the purchasing power of that 8,000 rupees coming out? In other words, you know, if you subtract out all the inefficiencies, what do you end up with? Any ideas? Pardon me? Yeah, you just multiply. So, yeah, so it's about 420, right? So it's it's five and a quarter percent. Um, so that's before, in, in a sense, you can think of that as almost like a a um, inflationary loss in your money. So the eight thousand dollar, eight thousand rupees that you started with are actually only worth 420 rupees when you t when you look at how effective that money spend is. That doesn't even say that you're building the right thing for the customer. Uh, now that's average for most organizations, right? That's so we just did simple in industry multiplication on the math. So if the average organization is essentially losing almost 95 percent of its effectiveness through ineff ineffective practices, then there's huge opportunities for improvement. So this isn't this isn't uh, data that you look at and go, oh, you know, life is terrible and and we're just going to give up because it's hopeless. Actually, it's like no, there's great opportunity there. We, we've got, you know, we could easily improve that number to, you know, 15, 20, 30 percent instead of five and a quarter percent by doing a few things, right? So there, there's huge opportunities, but we have to start focusing on that. Most organizations don't. So the other thing to think about is that in order to remove that waste, leaders have to get involved. So, you know, scrum masters and scrum teams have a lot of autonomy, but within a limited sphere. But if, if you need a dedicated, you know, mainframe test environment so that you can test the application that you're working on and you want to do that in relatively fast cycles. Most organizations that I've worked with, you know, they it's a shared environment and you can't get exclusive access to it and it doesn't get cycled frequently and as a result the testing isn't very effective. So to solve that problem, you've got to go make a business case with some executive and they can maybe help with that. So there's a variety of different things that, you know, back to the executive case where executives can and need to get involved to solve those problems. So the fifth thing is that, you know, as you do these things, you have to improve through getting frequent feedback. So this isn't an exercise where you say, well, let's take the next six months, do our value stream map and improve our process. In the meantime, we won't actually deliver anything because we have to do process improvement first. The best way to do it is actually through frequent feedback, not just of the product, but also the process itself. So the two challenges in this are, first of all, building the right thing, making sure that you're, that you're building the right product. And the second thing is, is to build that product in the right way. And so the two ways to basically handle that kind of feedback, first of all, building the right thing, is that if you think about this, we kind of drew it before in a little bit different way, is that you've got some idea, you do some work, you deliver it out to a customer or a user, you measure feedback. So you've got some economic value coming back, maybe you've got some qualitative feedback coming back, you 
we've got other other interesting data coming back. Um, in interesting anecdote on that. Um, so one of our, our uh, members of our community was working with an organization, and he said that you know they be you know he kind of quoted that average statistic that you know forty or fifty percent of features developed are never used. And this organization is like, no, you know we're much better at that. And he essentially more or less said, prove it. Um, and they did. You know, they said, OK, well, we're going to instrument our application. They were convinced that they were going to see much higher numbers. How high do you think their number was? Features implemented that were actually used, 10%. So 90% of what they built was not actually being used by the customer. Now, that's not too hard to imagine. You, know, you take something like, let's say, PowerPoint here. I mean, I use, it for, I, I, I use that a lot for these kind of presentations. I use a fraction of what's in there. Microsoft Word probably even worse. And I've written books and done lots of other things like that. So you know, there's lots of opportunities for improvement. But so, so an interesting way to frame those experiments to figure out whether you're delivering the right thing, and I, I pulled this from a book uh, called Lean UX by Jeff Godelf and Josh Seiden, is that you, you frame, the, in, instead of just using the user story format, you, you frame it a little bit differently. You say, you know, we believe that doing this, in other words, the, the feature that you're going to build, or a description of the thing that you're going to build, for these people, in other words, the personas that you have, sort of step through this, um, these, you know, for these people, in other words, your personas, um, will achieve you know, a particular outcome. So, you know, and, and we'll know that's true, and this is the important part, when this measurement changes. Because if you can't measure it, it's just all a theory anyway. And so lots of, lots of scrum teams are doing lots of good things, even if they're delivering into production. Um, but they consider done, you know, done is when it's shipped into production. Well, actually, done is when you get feedback on that thing that you built the right thing. So by, by making your experiments more explicit and saying, how are we going to measure that? How would we know? This is the problem with all, all goal setting. So, you know, our goal is to do, you know, achieve this. Well, how will we know that that happened? Otherwise, you know, if, it's, if, if you can't measure it, it's just sort of a, a platitude. So um, you can use those outcomes to plan the sprints, right? You can, you can say, well, you know, product owner could say, well, you know, here's the goal that I'd like to achieve in this sprint, or here's the experiments we want to run in this sprint. And the development team can come back and say, great, you know, we can do that. Um, or they might come back and say, well, we don't think we can do that in the sprint. You know, there's too much work to do, but could we scale that back a bit? So there's a bit of give and take in the planning process, but, but effectively using outcomes has a, has a more interesting way of planning the sprint than simply going, you know, we're going to del deliver this number of stories, and, and well, in, in a sense, so what? If, you know, if you, um, kind of a, a side note about what's the right size for a release. Well, the right size for a, you know, the, the minimum size for a release has to be essentially one changed outcome for at least one person, hopefully a group of people or a whole persona. But you know, if it doesn't change the outcome, it's not worth doing. And if it changes more than one outcome, then you essentially you've overinvested in that release. So anyway, the out outcomes end up being really you know simple but pervasive and, and powerful in the way that you organize the work. The second thing is that when you get to the sprint review, the question is, well, OK, we ran this experiment. Or you know we, we set out to deliver this outcome. How do we do? Well, you know that's we if we set our goals so that we can measure them, then it's it's a pretty easy matter to say. Well, we either achieved it or we didn't. Or the answer might come back. Well, you know we don't know. Okay. Well, then in our retrospective, we can start to think about well, you know how do, how do we get better at measuring that? You know, how do we get better at improving our processes to measure that? But but outcomes end up being really, really an interesting and important way, I think, to just reframe the discussion about what you're trying to achieve. Okay. So then building the thing right, when you know it, you can you use your retros your sprint re retrospectives to say, okay, how'd that go? What could we improve? Um, do do did we build the right thing? Um, if we didn't, maybe you know how can we we get better at that? If it's, you know, we had a lot of waste, you know, we, we stumbled around, we didn't collaborate very well, how could we improve that? So there's a variety of ways that, that you can focus on that continuous improvement process and 
that's really why we're we're adopting things like Scrum or Agile in, in general anyway, as we, we want to use a feedback mechanism so that we can continuously improve. So, uh, to summarize, you know, the, the first thing, you know, the, the scaling uh, might, you know, often involves lots of changes in processes, you know, changes in the way people work, maybe changes in roles, but we lose sight of, you know, if it, if it really becomes a process kind of thing, and people think of it as, well, you know, we're just changing our processes, and it doesn't really involve leadership about achieving some greater goal for the organization, then it kind of falls flat. You know, it just turns into kind of a mechanical scrum, and that's not really valuable to anybody. It, it ultimately does, isn't sustainable. So leadership's really important in helping to establish the right goals and then removing the impediments to achieve those goals. Then, you know, what we want to do in order to scale is we want to get everybody's creativity and energy applied to solving these problems in new and different ways. And you know, one of the things that it's easy to lose track of is that you know, all of us in our personal lives, you know, we have, you know, everybody has all these all this complexity, but you know, we're able to do this on our own, right? There's nobody telling us what to do and how to do it and when to do it. You know, we, we can self-organize in our own personal lives pretty effectively. But when we come into an organization, sometimes we, we inadvertently, we, we think that people, you know, somehow they can't think for themselves. And we create an environment in which that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So helping the teams to, and, and the stakeholders to self-organize and really leverage all that power and energy that people have is hugely important. And then focusing on outcomes so it becomes clearer the connection between that goal and the work that people are doing ends up being really key to scaling because it's just, it's, it's incredibly easy to just get lost in this mass of user stories that you're delivering and eventually you start forgetting why are we doing this and what are we trying to achieve and, and leadership doesn't know whether you're actually getting any benefit out of it. It just feels different. Um, so that's hugely important. And then, you know, as you along that way, removing waste and improving through frequent feedback ends up being really hugely important. So those are, are the five things that I think are really important in scaling. Um, we've got about five minutes or so for questions. So um, if you've got any, then uh, you can open it up. Yep. Yeah. How, how easy is it? Yeah, um, so it, it's, in some ways, it's, it's easy to do once you get a paradigm shift to happen. Um, so a lot of the work that I've done is, is around these executive workshops where we help leaders to really understand what motivates people and how they're going to get the best result from working with those people. And, and so helping the leaders understand that you know they've got really talented people in their organization who want to do great work, but they're often held back by you know sort of the ineffectiveness of the processes. But you, they could achieve so much more if if you really kind of focused on not controlling them and guiding them, but rather to get them energized towards solving the right problem. So it's mostly a mindset change in leadership. Um, and there's a secondary problem that relates to the middle managers. So a lot of times leadership buys into this and the team people, the teams think it's great and the middle managers are like, well, what do I do? You know, how do I work? And so helping them understand how to become better serving leaders and, and getting them to realize that they have a hugely important role in helping their teams and that the value that they add is in this network of relationships that they have with other people in the organization to help get things done. And so they sort of go from being controllers and you know having to kind of keep control on everything to basically being kind of fixers, you know, people who can really kind of break loose log jams and be creative about things because they're also, they're, you know, most of them were really talented developers or other things, and then they got promoted and now they're kind of stuck in a role that they don't really like either. But it pays better and and they like that. So we have to kind of decouple. The, the sort of reward and compensation system and get people to focus on the right things. But so it's, so what I found, once people have a vision for how their lives can be different, then 
you get them to move toward where they want to be instead of, you know, since you know, the problem with, with a lot of, especially the middle managers, is that the way that we usually talk about the problem is that we talk about all the things they're not going to do. You know, you're not going to be managing people. You're not going to be telling people to do this. You're not going to be doing that. And, and there's nothing positive in that, and it's rather threatening. It's like, well, what if you know, that's what I do all, all my day? You know, they're not going to need me. It's like, actually, look at all those impediments. There are huge numbers of things they can help or, to remove. We just have to get them focused on that. So it, it's a mindset change, but it's also helping them to get started and focus on that problem. Any other questions or comments? We've got about two minutes. <laughs> 